surgery versus conservative care for shoulder instability. Kevin, what do we have for today's episode? Ooh, yep. Today we have a paper um, that we're going to go over that kind of gives us some insight into whether we should consider surgery or conservative care. Um, and then the, the title of this article um, from Brett Owens and colleagues uh, in the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery was the management of mid-season traumatic anterior shoulder instability athletes. So in season, these athletes are having some anterior instability, trying to figure out how to best manage these folks. And I thought this was a very insightful paper and definitely took away some good pearls from it. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, <clears throat> this is important for physical therapists, especially sports physical therapists. If you're seeing athletes that are coming in after they've had some sort of instability event, subluxation or dislocation, uh, your decision making is key because if you make the wrong decision, you could be setting folks up. And I'm, I hate to be a fear monger for long term issues, recurrent instability, arthritis, all sorts of bad stuff. So I think in the social media world, we're always very hopeful. We want to try to rehab everyone that comes through the door, avoid surgery at all costs. Um, this is a situation that's maybe different than most, I'd say. So I think it's a very important discussion. Um, it's, I don't know, it's a little sad. It's one of those things where I think physical therapy isn't as powerful as we'd like it to be. Um, but obviously we care for patients who want to do what's best for them. It's not all about healing everyone with our, you know, exercise hands, whatever else it is. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, just regarding a little bit of information that was interesting from the abstract. Um, so, you know, the reason why they did this is they were saying that regarding optimal treatment of an athlete with an in-season shoulder dislocation, there's very limited data to guide treatment. So, you know, we looked at the research for some answers and there wasn't a ton and they decided to come out with this paper. So this was in 2012, um, but I think it still is a pretty powerful paper today. Yeah. So, I also went, I added some other references that are newer and it's, it's still the same. It hasn't changed. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Same type of same stuff. So, um, what they find is rehab may facilitate a return to sport within three weeks. But like we've talked about uh, in the previous episode, there's a high risk of recurrence. So bus and colleagues found 87% of athletes return to play in an average of 10 days, but there's a significant recurrence rate of 1.4 per athlete season. So we try to get these folks back, but you know, like you were saying previously, we, we might be doing them a disservice. We might not have all the tools at our disposal to prevent the recurrence. Um, and we'll talk about this, but bracing may reduce recurrence, but it comes with a con of perhaps restricting, restricting their range of motion for sport. Um, so if you picture that baseball pitcher, they have some instability. Uh, you put them in a brace for a few weeks to prevent recurrence, but now they could be very tight. And if we're mid season, that could mean more time that they miss as they try to get their motion back. Um, but then, you know, on the other hand, surgery, it reduces the risk of recurrence, but then the athlete misses significant time. And, you know, this is the tough thing that you were talking about. This is, I kind of hate telling people no and telling people that they, they can't do something or being the bearer of bad news. I try to be like as optimistic as possible with patients all the time. I never want to be like nocebic and make them feel like crap. But this is the hardest thing for me is if, you know, if I really do think we need to miss some some significant time and surgery is going to be the, the play, um, breaking that news to someone is the worst thing ever. They get all upset. You know, it could be their senior season of high school. They're not going to play in college and you just feel terrible. But, um, you know, we'll get into kind of what Owens does in this article is is help us with some criteria based decision making. Yeah. For sure. I, I added that. Uh, what's funny is uh, Kevin actually made slides for this presentation. If you're listening to this on the podcast version and you can't see it, there's a video. There actually is a video to this. Uh, if you go to YouTube, check it out. But we have slides we're going off of. And Kevin did his due diligence and made some incredible slides. And then last minute, I went in there and changed a bunch of stuff. So just threw that uh, curveball and Kevin's reading that stat. Uh, but anyway, that stat by bus basically showing that a large majority of folks are going to have 1.4 more dislocations over the course of their season, which is pretty wild. And it gets worse if you were more of a contact sport. So let's say you're playing rugby or football 
and you're halfway through your season, you have a dislocation, you're probably going to have a couple more when you return back, right? We already discussed this in the prior podcast, so I'll be short. Uh, if you have more recurrences, it's more chances for concomitant injury. So let's say the rotator cut, the brachial plexus gets dinged up, and you start losing more bone. So on the humeral side as well as the glenoid side, and that's going to potentially require more challenging surgeries, right? We don't necessarily want to go down that route. Um, what I thought was interesting too, uh, and I will say that I've had the same kind of experience myself is that return to play is very quick, which is super misleading, right? If you think about a tendinopathy, tendinopathy is a little bit more safe to push through pain. When someone has a dislocation, it just kind of feels better quickly, right? Which is super misleading. And it just reminds me of ankle sprains. So ankle sprain stats are very, very similar, right? People have return to play within like 1.2 days. It's crazy. People get back so fast. And oftentimes they're still playing through pain. But the recurrence rates are incredible. They're so huge, right? And what is interesting to me too is that for these folks, if you do a very thorough job with the rehab, the recurrence rates are actually quite a bit lower. So I'm not saying that if you do a great job with your rehab, then your athlete will be fine. But I would be curious if people gave it a longer period of time to rehab conservatively and then try to return, if that would change some of these recurrence rates, redislocation rates. I, I don't really know, but I just thought that was really interesting. To go along with the video today, I have a little gift for you. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet for shoulder instability. It's a four-page PDF that goes over everything you need to know about shoulder instability. We go over prevalence, anatomy, joint arthrokinematics, risk factors, and different types of instability, causes of instability, whether or not your patient should undergo surgery or have conservative care like physical therapy, and finally, rehab implications for all the different types of instability. So if you're looking to get up to speed about shoulder instability in less than 10 minutes, then this PDF is for you. I'll leave a link in the show notes in the description. Go ahead and click on that and then download it and then get back to what you're learning about right now. All right. So um, we have this table here from the article. Um, and what it's showing is indications for non-surgical management of traumatic anterior shoulder instability. So some injury characteristics that we'll see are an initial shoulder dislocation, um, an osseous defect of the glenoid less than 25%, so less than 25% bone loss in the glenoid rim. Um, same thing with the humerus, so a hill sacs, osseo defect of the humeral head less than 25%, and absence of fracture or soft tissue injury that requires surgery. So in this type of scenario, um, they're saying this is something that perhaps we could try to manage conservatively. Um, I think what is of note here, though, is if you're a PT with direct access, uh, you don't know these things unless they go ahead and consult with a, a shoulder doc, right? We can't tell how much bone loss they had. We can't tell uh, if there was other soft tissue injuries or, um, you know, we might be able to tell if there's a brachial plexus type injury, but you know, we, we have to probably get these folks in anyway to get some baseline imaging. And then I think the, the time of year matters for this person in terms of their sport. And, you know, if they have three weeks left of their last season, perhaps they finish it out conservatively. So we always take those things into uh, considerations. So the characteristics they talk about for this sport specific and the, the player characteristics where we will try to manage conservatively is that they're in season and the athlete really wants to return to sport. Uh, I think that's a big one because we can have all the data to support that the person should have surgery, but it always comes down to what the patient wants. And I think it's just our job as long as we're giving them proper education. Um, I try to tell my patients that in these types of scenarios, it's a risk reward type equation. So I think we're a little bit on the risky side. But as long as they understand what's at play, I'll let them make the decision. Um, if it's a non-overhead or a non-throwing athlete, and they also play a non-contact sport, so you know this might be something like soccer um, type thing. You know, only few sports I think fit in that category. They could be someone that could return um, non-operatively, um, and also if they can complete sport-specific drills without instability. So I think this is where we would be in rehab. And we would be testing people and, you know, seeing as sport specific as possible at that end stage of rehab. How do they feel? What's their confidence level? Are they having any instability? If they're kind of checking those boxes and then just some other things I put on the side here, um, 
you know, if their range of motion is pretty symmetrical, we're doing some dynamometer strength testing in provocative positions, and it's pretty symmetrical. They don't have any apprehension. Maybe these folks, after a course of a couple weeks, and they're hitting these markers, these criteria for progression, we can try to return a sport and kind of take it from there and see what happens. But, you know, I think if, if, if we're unsure, we have to refer for imaging of how much potential bone loss. And if they're not hitting any sport specific criteria in rehab, they're not hitting good strength and range of motion, then I think we're, we're putting them at risk and we're, we're leaving a lot of information on the table. If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now, I'm actually a really big fan of education, and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want, which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal with the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important they understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better, they go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seed of reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. Second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later. So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. And now back to your learning. That was some really good stuff there, Kevin. I like that. So A, I think one of the big takeaways is if you have a patient that has, um, a dislocation, or you think they had a dislocation, probably wise just to send back to the doctor, right? We need some imaging to figure out how bad it is. Uh, you can use some special tests to try to figure out maybe how bad it is. If someone has gross weakness, maybe there is some rotator cuff stuff going on in there, right? So if we tore part of the rotator cuff tendon, I think it's greater than 50 or 75%, probably want to have to have surgery after that uh, for having gross instability. So anytime I try to get them to any degree of external rotation, they feel very unstable. That'd be another reason to send. But as Kevin said, we need more information. So this is one of those situations where I would send back the doc right away. I wouldn't wait on that. Uh, better safe than sorry. The doc may send them right back to you, right? But that's okay. Uh, then you can start with your conservative approach. But I do think it's smart to, to send to the doctor. Um, and I think the other important point you brought up is that ultimately the decision really is up to the patient. You know, um, I, I've had some patients, I think I was mentioning the other day about one patient that had multiple dislocations, rugby player was going to start their season, didn't want to get surgery, didn't want to get any imaging, right? And I just really told them how important I thought it was. They decided they didn't want to do it. And they actually had a great season. They, it was very, I would say, lucky. And they, this individual, it's wild. He, he must have been a very loose individual for this to happen. But um, after several dislocations anteriorly, um, he got MRIs, arthrogram, never had any sort of labral tear. And that doesn't make wow. any sense to me. Like, how can you dislocate several times, and not have that happen? 
Um, but yeah, educate the patient about the risk of returning back mid-season. We just told that stat, you're likely to have this recur 1.4 times, right? And if you're younger, if you're going back to contact sport, even worse, potentially, maybe a little bit less if it's going to be a non-contact sport, but it's still quite high. And as long as the patient has the information, they can make their own decision, right? Like if Kevin said, let's say it's a football player. They only have one more game left in the season. They're not going to be playing. Uh, in college, all they want to do is return back to play for this one game. It's incredibly important for them. They understand the risk of it. Then I can, I can understand that. Right. I mean, my thought is like, well, you need that shoulder for the rest of your life. You probably still want to potentially go and get surgery, but that's me, right? That's not the patient. If the patient feels it's important enough to them, then they can kind of go for it. Um, so as long as you educate them and they know what's up, they can make their own decisions. All right. And then kind of to contrast that, here is a chart from the study that's talking about indications for early surgery. So who, what folks are we just going to say we should do surgery on? Um, kind of the opposite of what we were just talking about. So if they have a glenoid bone loss of over 25%, um, that like you mentioned, the greater than 50% rotator cuff tear, um, an off track hill sacs lesion. So you know, I believe this is where they have enough bone loss in the humerus that when they start to move their arm in certain degrees of motion, um, it's kind of off track and we're getting some abutment of the bone loss area with the glenoid and the humerus can kind of pop out a little bit. Um, an irreducible dislocation. So, I mean, yeah, they, they can't, we can't reload, we can't relocate it. We can't reduce the dislocation. They're going to need surgery. Um, if they were folks that we thought we could rehab conservatively and they're failing, meaning they either have another dislocation event or they just continue to feel unstable, they can't return to sport, probably want to consider surgery. Um, they can't tolerate restrictions early on. So they dislocate. We want to put them in a brace perhaps or a sling, and they're just not adherent to that. They might need surgery. Um, and then, like I said, they can't do sport specific drills without pain or apprehension. So, uh, Owens and colleagues are saying these are absolute indications for surgery. We should be considering surgery in those scenarios. Uh, and then we should really be considering surgery, a relative indication list of um, they've had more than one dislocation in the same season because we probably risk more significant concomitant injuries. If they're a contact or collision athlete, like a rugby or football player, they're probably, you know, their risk is higher. So they probably want to do surgery. Um, the season's over and we have some time off and we can start to think about how to be optimized for the upcoming season next year. Probably want to consider surgery in that case. Um, if they're young, we talked about the different types of collagen and there's a, a chance that these folks are going to continue to be unstable. We might consider surgery for those younger folks again, which is so weird because like you said, in every other case, it's like, it, it seems to be an advantage to be young. We bounce back faster, but I guess instability, it's, it's different. We have to think about it a little differently. Yeah, for sure. It's funny because I switched up that chart on you. I, you had the Owens one in there and I threw the bus one in there. Um, just like because the stuff, I think, yeah, it was a little clear. It was very similar. Yeah. So the other thing I thought was a little bit interesting is that they had this relative contraindication list, right? Um, and all those things would occur with the, with a the dislocation, but the author's, also advocated for surgery after a primary first time anterior dislocation. So despite that chart saying relative contraindications, the authors concluded that they should still get surgery. So, um, I would say that you want to proceed with caution, uh, anytime someone has any sort of dislocation anteriorly, Obviously, those are some of the things you can think about with your decision making to educate the patient about and decide whether or not they need to go back to the doctor if you're the first point of contact. Awesome. And and here's a kind of, you know, it's a little blurry, but it was hard to fit all on the slide. It's a algorithm from the Owens um, paper. Uh, I'm not going to go through every specific thing, but I, I think it will be helpful for folks to look at and maybe use in their clinical decision making. So, you know, it kind of takes you through, you have an in-season instability event, you probably want to refer for imaging and they're just, you know, if it's geared towards medical doctors, they're recommending a certain type of MRI, um, uh, certain type of image from a certain angle. 
Um, and then they're they're going through and just saying if there's a certain amount of bone loss, let's consider surgery. If there's a certain amount of soft t- tissue pathology, let's consider surgery. And then, you know, the algorithm kind of brings you to surgery or rehab conservatively. And it's based on the things we were just talking about. So I think if you're watching the YouTube version, um, it's helpful to look at that. Um, or if you want to look up the study yourself, I think it's a nice flow chart to have maybe with you in the clinic just to keep keep that on the top of your mind about is this someone I should be referring or should we be trying conservative uh, at least for now? Yeah, I thought it was good too. And even just looking through it, basically get some imaging. Is there greater than 25% bone loss? If yes, get surgery. If not, what's a soft tissue look like? Uh, if it's okay, go ahead and try physical therapy. If you can't get back, it just keeps on you know, dislocating surgery. Where did this happen? If it's at the beginning of the season, maybe consider physical therapy because you have more time to do a good job. Whereas if the end of the season, straight to surgery. And the last piece is that when you do your physical therapy, can you actually return to sport specific drills, which I think this is huge. If you have a patient that's just not getting back to the specific positions they need to get into for the sport, like there's no way it's going to work out well when someone slams into their arm full speed, right? Then you would consider surgery, but if they're getting back to sport specific activities, then maybe they're okay to return back to sport. So, okay. So I thought this was a really cool study that helps highlight some of the points we're talking about. I'm just going to read the title because it's pretty self-explanatory. Non-operative management of anterior shoulder instability can result in high rates of recurrent instability and pain at long-term follow-up. I'm just going to read the conclusion here because once you hear it, it all makes sense. At long-term follow-up of 17 years, which is awesome because it wasn't like after one season or at the one or two-year mark, it's 17 years later. So you can see what's going on with that shoulder after you've had a dislocation. There's a high rate of poor outcomes observed following non-operative management of anterior shoulder instability. Overall, 37.5% of patients experienced recurrent shoulder instability, 58.4% had recurrent shoulder pain, and 12.2% had symptomatic osteoarthritis development. Risk factors associated with adverse clinical outcomes included increased pain at initial visit, which basically if you have an extremely painful person, that's going to dictate how slow you go with rehab, but potentially how bad it's going to be long-term. Recurrent instability prior to presentation, a seizure disorder, which obviously you can have dislocations with that, and smoking, which smoking seems to be like the worst thing you can do for your body. (laughs) Yeah, Wow, those stats are crazy. Yeah. Um, But anyway, it's, you know, this stat, makes me feel bad about deciding to go conservatively first, right? Uh, Just because if you make the wrong decision, there's a chance you're setting some up for long-term pain 17 years later, more osteoarthritis, so on, so forth, right? And for some folks, maybe conservative care is the right, I feel like I'm just advocating for surgery, right? And and that's not really the case. I I just want to do what's best for the patient, really. Um, in some cases you might be able to get away with conservative care, especially if it's an older individual that doesn't want to get back to a contact sport, but just keep in mind that this is a major decision, right? And you want to make sure that you're setting your patient up for the best long-term solution. Uh, and sometimes that may be with surgery. All right. So now you have some good information to decide whether or not you should continue with physical therapy with your patient with instability or refer to a surgeon to potentially get a bank art repair or some other sort of repair for the instability. However, you still don't know about the key principles about treating shoulder instability. So I have a link for you. I'll leave it above my head. I want you to click on that. We'll go over what physical therapists need to know about shoulder instability. So go ahead and click on that link and I'll see you there. And lastly, if you want to go that next step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. So Insiders is like Netflix for physical therapists and coaches working with painful folks in the gym. You've got access to 100 plus webinars, ebooks, and courses. More recently, I've been taking all of my best content from YouTube. I've been taking out all the ads. I've been organizing it in a really step by step fashion in an entire course so you can easily go through it. And I add additional pieces to this to enhance your learning, right? So I just finished up my lateral ankle sprain course. And one of the big things I add to this was a protocol. So essentially, what do you do week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, six, seven, eight? You know me, I like working with athletes. I like working with really fit and strong people. So it's going to be a lot more robust than your typical protocol. Also, you have access to me. So inside of Insiders, you can leave a comment. 
and I'll get right back to you. I also have physical therapy CEUs inside of Insiders. So if you take the course, Essential Coaches Series, get a bunch of CEUs. And what's even better is you can start for just $1. After that, it's $25 per month. It's going to be the cheapest CEUs you can get. It's by far the highest value program that I offer at the cheapest price. So head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders to get started. I'll also leave a link in the show notes where you can check it out.